Hopefully you understand what just took place. If you don't, I got one word, busted. <laughs> That's just the word it is. And with today's social media technology, it, you, it's trust and distrust and suspicion. Uh, we come across that in a day. You know, trust goes up, trust goes down. We constantly trust someone or distrust someone on a given day. And trust isn't something that we just have, that we, you know, it's just given to us. It's for many of us, we have to build the trust. We have to learn what that means. And the way I think about it is when we have a, a, a trust with one another, it's like we have, it's like change in our pocket, like spare change. And when we make a mistake, we give change out, and someone says, okay, you're forgiven. You make another mistake, or you say something you shouldn't have, and oh, you're forgiven. But after a while, our change runs out. We have nothing left. And so we have a distrust with people because there's no more spare change to give. So what we do is we put a lie in place of the spare change. It's almost like a credit card spare change. We charge it on our credit to say, no, this is what happened. This is what took place. And we put lie upon lie upon lie. And after a while, our trust is actually in debt. So we want to learn how can we get trust where does trust come from how do we trust one another how can we build trust what if trust has been lost and what if you're in a relationship that trust has been broken how do you build that up again is it even possible to build trust back with someone who cannot be trusted anymore what if they're a family member what if there's someone who you love what if it's your children what if it's your parents or your siblings how do you trust when Trust has been broken. And if they are loved ones and you're living with them, how do you deal with that? Well, trust is not something that is easy to talk about. It's not something that is, is easy to gain because it is a life lesson that we learn. I have not gone to Taco Bell in over 10 years. And I went the other night. If you have not been in Taco Bell in our, in our uh, in Poinico Town Center, for a long period of time, it has changed. Some of you are Taco Bell fanatics, and you, that's where you eat all the time. But I have not been there in a long time. So when I walked in there, they re, you know, restructured everything, and, and uh, everything looks new. They did everything new, even the menu. So when I looked at the menu, I'm thinking, you know, taco, soft taco, you know, burrito, seven-layer burrito, you know, easy things. But the menu is huge now. So I don't know what to eat. I'm looking at the menu and thinking, ah, what, am, what is that? What is that? Three tacos, locos, tacos. What is that? Gorditos. Uh, I don't know what, what to eat, so I, I don't trust other things. So I just get the basic thing. Give me a seven-layer burrito. I'm, I'm used to that because we don't trust anything else. It's like when you go out to eat, you always eat the same thing wherever you go. I'll just mention some restaurants, and you can already say in your head what you're going to order. Nori's. You know what you're going to order, right? Ken's house of pancakes. You know what you're going to order. It's like it, it's in us. Kuhil Grill. You know what you're going to order. You already go in there knowing what you're going to order. Very rarely will we choose something else. Why? Because we just don't trust it. Trust takes a while to get, I mean, it takes a, a while to get used to something to build trust. We just got a new puppy. And this puppy is 16 weeks old. So it has been at their... The, the former house for 16 weeks. So now it's at our house. First of all, I didn't want to come out of my truck. It's like glued to the truck, just trying to grip, you know, the truck, and it can't. So I sat in the bed of the truck with that puppy for about 
10 minutes, 15 minutes, just trying to calm him down. His name is Bo. And he said, Bo, you know, you, you talk to your puppy. It's like, Bo, you're okay now. This is your new home. I felt like, you know, Simba and, you know, the Lion King and trying to talk to him and, you know, Mus, 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 what is his name? Musafa. Ooh, Musafa. And so I'm trying to talk to him and he's stuck. And so I take him out of the truck and I put him on the ground. I figure, this is familiar. It's grass. You, you, you're okay with that. But he didn't want to move. And so he's sniffing around and, and I'm trying to picture or imagine what he's thinking. Because it's on you, sights, sounds, and, and smells, of course, that's dogs. So he's trying to sniff around, and, and every move I make, if I make a sound on the ground, he turns around and he looks at it. So even late at night, we have a lot of cokey frogs where we live. So he's barking at the cokey frogs. <laughs> I'm like, that's just cokey frogs. Then you, early this morning, you know, I'll get up early in the morning, turn on the light. <laughs> I'm like, hey, it's me. It's alpha dog. It's me. I'll leave one room, turn on the light in another room. Like, Bo, same guy. It's me. He sees a shadow by the window. Like, Bo, seriously. Our other dog is looking at him like, Psh, rookie. It's, he has to get used to it. He doesn't trust the environment, and he's building trust with me. It takes time for trust to be built. David, who is on our staff and, and does a lot of our videos, he told me that in high school, they did this test, this little experiment of trust where you stand on a table and you close your eyes and you fall and everyone will catch you and all his friends were there to catch him. Well, he fell and his friends didn't catch him and let him fall on the ground. So I said, so did you trust your friends after that? And he said, nope. Not at all. No way was I going to go back on that table and fall because trust was broken. So if you look at trust, trust takes a while for it to be built up. Trust, trust can be broken. Sometimes you're in the middle of trust and trusting someone or something or, or even a group of people. So there's this thing called suspicion. You know, you're just suspicious of someone. You just don't know them well. Or if you're in a new work environment and new people, you just don't know them well. So sometimes there's suspicion. Or if, if someone tells you or gives you a heads up or a, a preview of someone you don't know, then it paints a, a picture in your head of who that person is. And it may not even be accurate. They could say things like, you know, that person right there, yeah, you cannot trust them. Why? Well, because you know their other job, I heard, and you fill in the, the blank, and now you have a preconceived idea on a person that you don't trust, and you've never met them. So trust is it's, it's a, it's a very uh, uh, sensitive issue because it's, it can be lost, it can be gained. And we want to be people who do trust, but at the same time, the question is, can we be trusted? Have we broken trust? There's a, a story in the Bible that, that will help us to learn about trust. In fact, David was a young shepherd boy who was with the sheep and, and he was building his trust with what he was doing. And word got out that this was a, a very gifted musician. He was, he was a good uh, young shepherd and he could do things well. Well, the story starts off with a, a, a man by the name of Saul. And if you're reading your devotions with us, you're, you're, you're going to catch all of this that Saul became Israel's first king. And the Israelites were the people that God chose to represent him. That's why you hear a lot about Israel when we read the Bible. So now you have the Israelites, and they want a king, so Saul becomes their first king. Well, Saul made some mistakes. He did things his own way. He was a people pleaser. And so now, but Saul is now king, and there's the enemy. And the enemy has a, uh, a giant, and we know him as Goliath. And there's this giant where the armies of Israel are afraid of him. But David catches this, and he says, well, what's, what's going on? He says, well, there's the giant, and, you know, we're afraid of him. David says, I'll take him out. Well, David does. David takes his sling and a rock, and then he just knocks this giant out, takes the giant sword, cuts his head off. So now everybody's cheering for David because David did a great thing. And now Saul becomes jealous of David. And Saul says, wait a minute, they're cheering for David that he did this? 
So now Saul began to despise David and look for opportunities to even kill David. So even though David was in his palace, Saul is looking for ways to kill him. David was brought in to, to console the king. When the Lord's anointing left Saul because of the, the decisions that he made, David was the musician that played music. They didn't have radio, so like us, we can just, you know, like when your kids are upset, watch. They'll put on their podcast or, I mean, their, their music, their iPods, and they'll just listen to music because it's, it's soothing. So they brought in David because he could, he could bring in music. But Saul was just so jealous of David. And so now Saul wants to kill David. David catches wind of that, and David says, I need to go. Well, Jonathan, who is Saul's son, tells David, yep, it's, it's truth that my dad wants to kill you. And Jonathan knows that David is a loyal man. Everybody knows that David is loyal. But Saul's jealousy causes him to want to take David out. So now David is on the run. While being on the run, Saul is chasing after him. David and his men are hiding in a cave. And Saul went to relieve himself, the Bible says. In other words, he went to the restroom. And while he was in there, one of David's men says, Hey, look, God has given you an opportunity to take him out. So David goes close to Saul, just cuts the, the, the corner of his robe off. And then when Saul was gone and, and the armies of Saul were some distance, David comes out and says, Saul, why are you pursuing me like this? Why do you think I'm trying to kill you? I am loyal. I have done nothing wrong. And David says, look, Saul, I even had the opportunity to kill you. This is a piece of your robe. But... I shall not touch the Lord's anointed lest God strike me. So I'm not even going to do that. So even then, David's trust was still there, but Saul still became jealous. David stayed loyal as long as he could, as long as possible. And he kept running and running and running, but then after a while, Saul's jealousy and Saul's anger got the best of Saul, and Saul kept making poor decision after poor decision. Well, how do we, how do we learn from this and, and trust? Because David was loyal, but still he had someone persecuting him. You could be someone who is very trustworthy, someone who, who does things well, but, but still people do things against you, and you're wondering, well, I'm trying my best. You know, I am not like this or like that person, or, and why do people treat me like this? It may not be you. It's just the way people may be. It could be jealousy. It could be anger. It could be bitterness. Whatever it would be, but you're a trustworthy person. Being a trustworthy person does not mean nothing happens to you and nobody treats you bad. Being a trustworthy person really has to do with you representing God well. Don't compromise the trust that has been built in you so that you fit in with everyone else. See, here's some things that we can learn. And the first thing, if you're writing notes, you can write this in, that trust can be gained. It can be gained. Did you know at an early age, from the moment we're born, we're learning about trust. From about 12 to 18 months of our age, we are learning things. Our experiences cause inside of our neural circuitry, you know, in our brains, that it, it actually puts patterns together so that when we're going to do something again, it's already learned that. It's kind of like uh, with computers, this thing called cookies. You know, cookies and computers, it, it puts something in there so it's quicker to load up a web page so that it doesn't have to reload. It's just quick. That's our neural circuitry. When we do something, an, an experience, we keep record of it, and there's a pattern. There's a, there's a, a way for our brain to keep record of it. Now, the, the good and not so good about it, the, the, the good is that when we learn something, we, can, we got it. We can, we, can, we can do the thing over and over again. When we do something bad, it keeps record. And that's a good thing, too. Let's just say as a baby, you're walking into the corner of something sharp, and you hit your head. It, it hurts. So pain tells your brain... Don't do that again. Or the next time you walk in that direction, be cautious because there's that sharp thing that poked you in your head and you didn't like it. So that's what our brain does. It puts these neural circuitries together. Now, once that happens, and as we grow up, depending on the type of experiences we had, 
it can carry into one relationship to the next and it can continue on that's why for many of us when we go from one relationship to the next whether it's a friendship or 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 a co-worker or or even in a relationship in a dating relationship sometimes when you're when you're, the trust has been broken there's a there's that circuitry that has been built neurologically so now it's stuck there now you take that and you put it into this new relationship you're already coming in with distrust and you're wondering why don't why am I behaving like this or the other person is saying why do you treat me like this and we say it like this I'm not the other person you're treating me like your old relationship and they, they don't want to, but they can't help it because it, the, the body is structured that way. And so now there's that neural circuitry that's already been embedded with that experience. Even though new experiences come in, we still have the old way. And they call it neural cement, where it's just stuck there. So now you can't, you can't think any differently because this is all you know. But how do you gain that trust? Where does it come from? How do you... How do you redo that? Well, the Bible says we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. I'm so thankful that God gives us the capabilities to renew our minds, that no, more neurons can be built, and then the old ones can die. That now you start trusting again, and you start with God. You don't start with man. You start with God. Now you're going to trust in man you're gonna trust in one another but it, it must start with God because he's the one that is trustworthy Psalm 118 verse 8 it says it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man it doesn't say don't put confidence in man it just says it's much better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man that, that's where we get our trust from have you ever played a silly prank on someone and it was funny to you or someone did that to you and and it was funny to them well it's creating within us a new way of thinking don't trust that person that's actually what's happening so if you continuously play play pranks on people you're causing yourself to not be trusted like that story we've heard the boy who cried wolf if you get caught by the same person prank after prank you're a little too trustworthy with that person because somewhere along the line you have to say to yourself wait a minute last time he said open the closet I did a snake fake snake jumped out at me and I got scared okay I'm not gonna do that again but this time he asked me to open the closet maybe he's telling the truth then you open the closet ah frog fake frog jumps out at you and is ah I never know he's gonna get me again oh you fell for it twice the third time comes around and he says, hey, can you open that closet? Um, I have something in there for you. It's a present. It's a gift. If you, if you trust that person at this point, then something's happening in you. You're a little too easy <laughs> to trick. But after a while, you begin to distrust the person. Why? Because they have no more change left in their pockets. And there's a distrust. See, trust can be gained, but at the same time, it also can be lost. Uh... Some time ago, Heidi gave me a, uh, a piece of, uh, I think it was a, like a candy bar. And she said, hey, try this. It was, it's a health bar. It's not really a candy bar. But she said, try this. And I was busy doing something. And so she just put it in my mouth. And I said, oh, it's pretty good. And she goes, you didn't even look at it. You trust me? <laughs> now, I've been with Heidi for almost 30 years. She has never given me anything to eat that tastes bad. She never took a bite of a sandwich and it honey you should try this this is amazing she's never done that so she has never given me any reason not to trust her in giving me food and it's the same way with God he has never given us any reason why we shouldn't trust him he's trustworthy Jesus says I am the way the truth and the life we can trust him see it starts with God if we want to build trust if we ever want to gain trust it's gonna start with God Romans 12, 15, 13, it says that I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, here's the, here's the hope in God. 
that he's able to cause us to overflow with this joy. That there is going to be trust that he will build us up. He's going to fill us completely because we trust in him. But it doesn't always work that way with people. Because not only can trust be gained, but the second thing is that trust can be lost. We can lose trust with people because of certain things we say or certain things we do. We lose trust with people. And here's what happens. We start off with a lot of change in our pocket with people. We have change. And we say, you know, I, I got change. Whatever trust has been built. Or, or some people, they just, they just start off with trust with you. And you say, yeah, I got all this change. And, and so now... There's these trust gaps that we all fall into. Let's just say, for instance, someone shows up late for work. There's already a gap of trust that's there. And in that gap, you're going to decide what you're going to put in that gap. You're either going to give the person the benefit of the doubt, or you're going to put in that gap something that they, they're doing that is wrong. And we're going to put in that gap whatever we want to choose to put in that gap. We're going to say, some of us will say, you know what, that person is late because they probably were doing something good. They're probably, you know, that's normally not like them, so they probably had some excuse for it. Let's not think about it right now. Let's take care of it later. On the other hand, you might be someone who is constantly doing that and constantly giving excuses, so people will put in that gap. They'll say, you know what, they're just lazy. They're tired. They're, they just didn't care. Whatever it is, we're going to put something in that gap. But here's what's very interesting we tend to put in the gap whatever we want on other people something that is personal or something that has to do with character we'll say oh they're late they're lazy they're always late you know uh, because they slept late or they never didn't do this they never call they're always late they're just they just didn't want to take care of this in the morning so they came in after it was done so we'll put in something that has to do with character the person who is late will put in that gap environmental issues. It was the traffic. I was just trying to be a good mom and take care of my children before they went off to school. I was just trying to be a good dad, take care of this. I was just trying to be a good husband, just trying to be a good wife. I was just trying to be a good coworker. I got you guys donuts. You know, whatever it would be. It, it, so we'll put in the gap, something environmentally when it's us. But when it's not us, we'll put something personally in that gap. When it should be the other way around, to give people the benefit of the doubt, to give people the grace that God gives to us. That when things like that happen, that we say, well, you know what I'm going to put in this gap? That maybe, maybe they were taking care of something. Maybe there's information I know not of. I know of people who ridiculed someone because they were late a couple minutes and come to find out somebody had actually passed away. And boy, what a fool they made out of themselves. See, the issue is not if somebody did right or wrong and now trust has been broken. The issue is what kind of culture do you want to have in your family, in your workplace, in your relationships? What is it, what is it going to be? Because you're going to determine what it's going to be like by what you put in those trust gaps. It's, it's going to be up to you. So you make that decision. But at the same time, if you're doing the same thing over and over, you're coming in and, oh, no, I'm, I was sick yesterday. I'm sorry I couldn't come in, but I went surfing. So you got caught. There goes some change. And you can say to your wife, oh, yeah, I was, I was working late, but you went to the bars. So there goes some trust because somebody took a picture of you and put it on Instagram. You're like, yeah, with your friends. And so now you're done. There goes some change. Or you say something to your children, no worry, daddy going to be there. And you weren't. And then there goes some trust. And now after a while, after you keep doing these things and, and you don't pull through and come through, you have no more change left and there's no more spare change to give. And now you're going into debt. Almost like now you owe people because trust has been lost. So now you try to do things over and over to please the people or the person so that trust can be built back. But guess what? We have no more change to give. We can't give it. We're, we're actually going into debt. If I do something that cost a quarter, let's just say in this spare change theory, but I only have one cent in my pocket left to give, then guess what? I'm 24 cents in the hole. So I have to figure out a way to make up for that 24 cents. And after a while, you're actually living a life to please people, to build trust back when it's not even accurate. 
or we use lie after lie so that our trust can be built up. Patrick Lencioni, in his book called Advantage, he calls it the fundamental attribution error, where we actually put change out of our pocket when someone else has to, or when someone else has to give change from their pocket because they did something to break trust, then I assume the worst. I say they're a liar or they're lazy or a personality issue. And on the flip side, I use, I use myself as, well, I, I, I didn't do anything wrong. I, I'm okay to try to make sure that trust has not been broken. And so I'll, I'll put myself in a position where I don't treat people how I want them to treat me when I should be treating people how I want to be treated. It's the golden rule. Well, for some reason, when trust has been broken, it's so hard to build it back. Now, if I'm doing the same things over and over again, expecting someone to just keep giving me change or spare change to say, no, 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 you know, I'll give you my spare change because I'm just so gracious, and we take advantage of that, it won't be too long till they run out of their change for you. That's where in our workplace we get released or fired or in a relationship there's just no more love left, no more trust. And we say, you know, we're done because I've given you all of my spare change too. So now trust is gone. Where do we get this back? Because if it's true that it can be lost and it's also true that it can be gained. You know, Saul lost a lot of trust when he became king and he made some decisions that were not according to the ways of God, he just lost the trust. King David comes in and and starts to build trust with the people. David built trust with people so well that even his enemies trusted in him to a certain degree. People that really didn't know David, they just knew of him, of killing Goliath. They just knew of him. They didn't trust him because they didn't know from what angle he was coming from. In fact, when David was running from Saul, he actually defected to the Philistines from where Goliath came from. Because he's running from Saul, he's saying, you know, we're not going to survive. We've got to go somewhere. So they went there. And so now the Philistines are at war with Israel, and David is going to go out to war with them. And the king is saying, you know, I, I trust David, but the men says, what if he turns on us? And the king says, you know, I, there's nothing in him. There's nothing in him that I can see that would cause me not to trust him. But the men were still suspicious of him. People will still be suspicious of you even though you have good intentions. Saul's intentions were for self. You may have good intentions for people and they still may not trust you. Saul made some foolish decisions. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, Samuel speaks to Saul and Samuel tells Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be the commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. See, Samuel gave Saul the benefit of the doubt. He said, Okay, so Saul, what's happening? And Saul actually made a sacrifice that he wasn't supposed to. Samuel was the only one who was supposed to do the sacrifice. Also, Saul was supposed to destroy all the Amalekites, this surrounding nation that God says, destroy them all, lest their descendants follow after them and then wipe you guys out. So you got to take care of everything. Well, Samuel comes to Saul and says, Hey, Saul, so what's going on? And Saul says, Oh, here's what happened. And he didn't obey the full commands of the Lord. And then Samuel says, wait a minute. How come this is still there? Why is the king still alive? Why are there still sheep there? And Saul says, oh, the people, you know, they they wanted to spare the best of the sheep and offer it to God. And then the king, the people wanted the king. They spared the king. And Samuel is trying to give Saul the benefit of the doubt. And Saul just has no more change left to give. No more spare change. He's just done. Samuel says, oh, man, you acted foolishly. I gave you the benefit of the doubt. You could have come clean. See, you know how we gain trust back? You just come clean. You become a trustworthy person. 
In other words, you become someone who is worthy of trust. If you break trust and you want to gain that back, it takes a long time, sometimes years, sometimes quicker. It depends on the person you cause distrust to happen with. Like with children, I'm just going to lay this out. Kids, what you're doing that is wrong, your parents know. They know. They know. No, they don't know. No, they know. Your parents know. See, the one thing parents really hate, it's not when you make a mistake. It's not when you do something that is wrong. You know what parents really despise? It's when you lie. Right, parents? We know our kids are going to make mistakes. We know you're going to make mistakes. We know you're going to do things that are wrong. You know how we know? Because we did the very same things. We did the very same things. So you might as well confess. Might as well just come out clean and say, you know what, mom was me, okay? I took home. I took the money. And when you confess, it's different. You still can get lickings, but maybe less. <laughs> it's just different. When you confess, it's different. And your parents will tell you that. You say, look, just tell me the truth, and all will be okay. And the kids are like, not. Say that last time. But that's how you gain trust back. You take initiative. You be proactive. Even at work, if you're running late, don't think of an excuse. Just call in. And maybe you've done that before, but you know what will happen after a while? You yourself will begin to discipline yourself to be better in whatever it is because now you're being proactive. You're not hiding. You're not trying to uh, fake anybody out. You're not trying to uh, uh, make like you're doing something else. You, you're actually trying to be trustworthy. And now you're saying, no, I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to take initiative. So instead of your boss coming to you over and over again for the same thing, now you go to your boss and say, you know what? This project was supposed to be done last week. I'm a little short on time. I'm letting you know this is what I'm doing up until this time. I'm going to get better at this. So before you come into my office, I'm coming to yours. And you be proactive. In school, don't wait for the teacher to say, hey, your project was due yesterday. You're hoping they forget. They don't forget. They have apps now for this stuff. <laughs> they have calendar systems with your name on it in highlight, with the hopes you turn it in. So we can't fool people, but we can be proactive and gain trust back. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, it says, There are seven things that the Lord hates and cannot tolerate. A proud look a lying tongue, hands that kill innocent people, a mind that thinks up wicked plans, feet that hurry off to do evil, a witness who tells one lie after another, and someone who stirs up trouble among friends. See, this is not a way to build trust. This is a way to build distrust and, dis and, and distance with people. They just don't want to be around you. But God says you take the responsibility and you do your part when trust has been lost. Don't blame other people. It's your choice. Don't blame people when, when you do something and try to put it on them. Reminds me of the burglar who went into the bank to blow this safe and there was a note written right on the door and it says, please don't blow up our safe with dynamite. The safe is already open. <laughs> He's like, no way. Turns the handle, bag of sand falls on his head, alarms go off, gates come down, boom, locked down. Finds himself in prison. His friend comes to visit him. He says, what happened? Why, why, what, what are you in jail for? He said, well, I, I was going to blow this safe. He said, okay, so what happened? He said, well, there was a note on there that said, don't blow the safe. It's already open. So what did you do? Tried to open it. And what happened? Alarms went off. So what? I'm not going to trust people ever again. I'm thinking... <laughs> it's not their fault you were breaking in you were the one who was doing the act and sometimes we feel like it's everybody else's fault but you did the act regardless of some, if someone put a note right smack dab in the middle of your decision to tell you do this instead of blaming other people take the responsibility and just own up to it because trust will be gained after that 
You'll be able to become someone who's trustworthy. We may not have second chances. We may only have one shot to gain trust back. But thanks be to God that He gives us chance after chance after chance to build trust because trust comes from Him. Here's the last thing. When you're trying to build trust back up or when it comes to trust in any issue, that to recognize recognize trust opportunities and then respond wisely. We can recognize trust opportunities. You're going to feel it. You're going you're to feel that gap. You're going to say, well, here's my opportunity to be truthful or to cover it up. Here's my opportunity. Well, this is the opportunity to respond correctly. See, trust is not, trust is not something we can see or something, something that we can put on a chart and say, well, this is how much I trust today. This is how much you can trust me today. It's intangible. You can't see it. You can't grasp it. So in building our trust, it's something that we actually do. We become people who are proactive. David did that. The second time David saw the king with his men, King Saul with his men, after the cave incident, he sees Saul with the whole army sleeping. And Abishai, David's, David's, one of David's men, he says to David, he says, hey, let's, it's your opportunity to take him out. This, the Lord is giving this to you, that you can take Saul out. Because people will say that to you. They'll say, now's your opportunity to get back. Here's some things that, there's some dirt on this person that you can say. Here's some ammunition that you can use. But watch what King David does. Uh, he isn't king yet, but watch what David does. In fact, 1 Samuel chapter 26, Abishai says to David, he says, this is the moment. This is the moment. God has put your enemy at your grasp. Let me nail him to the ground with his, with his spear. One hit will do it. Believe me, I won't need a second. But David said to Abishai, don't you dare hurt him. Who could lay a hand on God's anointed and even think of getting away with it? See, you're going to have opportunities to either build trust or lose trust. And David said, no, 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 even though I can do this, even though if, if, if it's, it looks like an opportunity for me to take him out, I'm not going to do it. Why? Because I will not touch the Lord's anointed. You see, trust begins with God. That's where we get trust from. If we do things according to the ways of God, our trust gets built up exponentially quicker than if we put our confidence in man or with people. It's with the Lord. We do things His way. Some people would have taken advantage of that. But David says, no, not me. Because David understood that he was not to touch what, the, what God had anointed. He says, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, but what if I'm right? What if I have all the right to do so? What if, what if this would be the thing that I do that causes that person never again to hurt me, never again to come near me? What if, what if this is the perfect time, but it's not of the Lord? Watch, watch how Proverbs tells us, Proverbs 21 two. You may think that everything you do is right, but remember that the Lord judges your motives. Interesting, he doesn't judge our actions because our actions can look right, but he judges our motives, the secret intentions of the heart. That's what he judges. You know, I tell you what is so loving about God. God said, you know what, you, you don't have enough spare change in your pocket to live this life, so I'm going to give you spare change once you say yes to my son because your life is going to change, so I'm going to give you more change. And God says, I'm going to give you some spare change because now you're going to live your life for me. It's going to be a new life, a brand new way of thinking, and I'm going to help you with this change. But now you don't, you don't give spare change because you did something wrong. Now you overflow with change so that you can help other people find true change. It's not for us now. It's now for other people so that they too can find the Lord. He says, that's what I want to do in your life. Psalm 57 verses 1 through 3, it says, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings, I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed away. I will cry out to God, Most High, to God who perform, performs all things for me. 
he shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. See, God gives us the assurance of faithfulness in his son that paid the debt of our sins for all of eternity. It's not just a, a one-time deal where he says, here's a couple, here's a couple things that I want to do in your life and, and hopefully you can do something with it. He says, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay your debt because you've been trying to pay your debt of sin so that people trust you again. He says, it's not going to start that way. You got to come to me. You got to cry out to me. And I'm going to be the one that fills you afresh so that now your change is overflowing and people will recognize the change and understand that it's not you who they're beginning to trust. It's God in you that they're trusting. Amen. Man, you can close your Bibles and put away your notes. You know, every single one of our monies, and I know you know this, when we had our, our money system, they were going to put a couple of things on our coins. They wanted to put our country, our God, or God, our trust. But they wanted it to be something that would be perpetual so that those who continue to live on in this great nation, these United States of America, would remember why we're such a great country. And so stamped on all of our money, we have these words, and we can say it together. Ready? Go. In God we trust. And it's a reminder for us that our forefathers said, this is why we became a great nation. It's because in God we trust. It's not going to be in one another. It's going to come from God. That's the one we trust. And, it's, and because we trust in God, because we're living for him, people will begin to trust, not necessarily us, but God who dwells in us. Let that be our prayer today. Every time you look at our money, because I know tr they're trying to take that off of our money, but to be, re be reminded that it's in God we trust. And if you're someone who says, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, then we do everything possible to gain trust so that when people see our life, not only will they trust us, but they understand that there is a God who can be trusted. And then we'll begin to understand God a little bit better. Would you pray with me? Let's bow our heads for a moment. Let's pray. Lord, you've given us a, a reason to trust you. Sometimes you're apprehensive because we look at our life we look at people who have caused distrust in the relationship that we have with them. Maybe we have a hard time trusting you because of our earthly father. Whatever the case would be, sometimes it's hard to trust even you. Some of us believe in you, but we don't trust you. But you've never given us any reason not to trust you. Sometimes we don't understand it all, but that doesn't mean that we should not trust you. It just means we don't understand everything. But as we understand trust a little better, the gaps that come with trust and, and spare change that, that run out after a while, you've given us eternity. Your son, Jesus Christ, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, that gives us all the reasons why we can trust you. So, Lord, we pray that in our relationships, in our work environment, in our personal life, that we would begin to be the kinds of people who are trustworthy, that we do things that are worthy of people's trust in us, in the words we speak, the actions that we have, because it is far better to put our trust in you than our confidence in man. So that's what we choose to do today. We put our trust in the God in whom we trust. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said, amen.